in the background. And children have to operate in a world that's actually that complex, but they're not smart enough, and neither are you. So they build partial representations that sort of work, and the parents scaffold them. So the way children manage this, like children, they don't know anything, but hey, they're still alive, so what's up with that? You know, part of it is the child is laying out one of its procedures in the world in accordance with its understanding and something goes wrong. What does the child do? Cries, right? It, it defaults, it defaults to this distress cry and what happens is the adults move in with their superior skills and their enhanced understanding and they mediate between the partial knowledge of the child and the actual complex world and without the child. That's why if you take your child to the mall and just leave you know, it doesn't take very long for them to get really, 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 really upset, you know, depending on the child. Some of them almost instantaneously, you know. One day I was in the Boston airport with my daughter, she was about three and three and a half maybe, and my son, he was about two, and we were there to pick someone up. It was just packed, and so I had them by the hand, you know, and uh, I told my daughter a bunch, if she ever got separated from me in a crowd, just to sit down immediately, wherever she was, or as close there by, and I would find her. Don't move. Well, somehow I got separated from them, and I looked behind them, and they weren't there, and I found out later she'd followed someone else who looked like me from behind. And she, I found her in about three minutes, you know, which is a long time, man. If you're three years old at an airport, she was sitting there like paralyzed, you know. But her, her brother was with her, and he didn't care at all. And the reason he didn't care is because as far as he was concerned, she was an adult. But as far as she was concerned, she was an abandoned kid in an airport. You know, it was very hard on her, and it's because you know, she was protected from the complexity by her primordial representations and my presence. But as soon as my presence disappeared, the complexity came flooding back and just overwhelmed her. That's chaos and uncertainty. And then she'd cry, and the cry says, Help, I'm out of my league, I'm drowning, I'm drowning, you know? Intervene. And so that's how kids, in part, can get along in the world with their incomplete knowledge representations. It's always also how you get along in the world. Because you're, it's incomplete beyond belief, but you've got all these other people around you and the whole damn society filling in the gaps. And so, you walk around like you know what you're doing, but you don't. You, know, you just hardly know it all. You know, if you can fit into that system, great. You've got it on your side, and, and you can use it to fill the gaps. That's also partly why people are so concerned with maintaining their social identity. Like the real identity, I'm not talking about some surface identity, but you see, because you have set up a set of expectations and desires about how you want the world to unfold. And you do that within a social context. And as long as your desires and the actions of the community match, which means you're at home, roughly speaking, as long as they match, you stay emotionally regulated. You like that. That's why you can stay calm in here. It's like your desires are being played out by everyone else, because one of your desires is that none of these crazy primates starts brandishing a knife for example, or even twitching, or any of that sort of thing. You don't want any of that. And if it starts happening, it's like, you get wary very quickly, and maybe you'll look, and maybe you won't, and maybe you'll freeze, maybe you'll get the hell out of there, or maybe you'll get aggressive. But that match has to maintain itself intact, or your entire nervous system gets dysregulated. And the reason for that is that as soon as that match is disrupted, the underlying complexity and chaos of the world reveals itself, and so does your inadequacy. And then your body defaults into predator mode and, and the fact that you don't know anything and that everything is really complicated becomes very evident to you very quickly. And people hate that. It's the worst thing that can happen to them, the bottom falling out of their world. And so and that happens more when your fundamental presumptions about things are, are challenged. And then you have to solve the problem of what constitutes a fundamental presupposition. You know, how do you know which presupposition is peripheral and which one's central, and you can tell in part because the more upset you get about something, the more central it is that that thing's about to your entire structure of belief. And that's one way of getting into that unconscious structure of belief from a psychoanalytic perspective. So one of the things that happens to me, for example, as a therapist, is I'll be talking to my clients and they'll be talking about something difficult and all of a sudden they'll cry. And they often don't know why, so I stop them right there. It's like, something went through your mind, something happened. And the cry indicates that you've moved beyond your domain of competence out into the unknown world, all of a sudden, into chaos. What's that chaos? What exactly happened? And people, you know, they're usually embarrassed that they cry, but often they can remember what flitted through their mind, and it's a represent, it's a, 
It's some encounter with the chaos beyond their conceptual systems that produces that emotional response. And then we can dig into that, and find out oh, that's a trauma, especially if it's more than a year and a half old. And those can be of various depths and profundity. You know, sometimes they're so bad that the person just breaks down completely and they never put themselves together. You know, that's when something's just walloped you. It's hit you right at the bottom of your axiomatic structure, so to speak, right at the trunk. But when you're doing therapy with people and you watch how they respond emotionally, you look for those tiny eruptions of negative emotion. And those are like holes in their conceptual structure. And those have to be sewed up by them and you in the process of dialogue. You figure out, okay, there was a bit of unexplored territory there that manifested itself. It produced an emotional response in you that indicates that you've reverted in some sense to childhood. That would be the Freudian interpretation. Now we have to figure out what it was that that's in that hole, what caused that tear, and then we have to go back and articulate it and analyze it and study it until we can sew it up and, then, and, and, and get to the gist of it to make it into an adaptive story and then you can leave it behind. And it actually produces neurological transformation as you do that, the memories in some sense actually move their psychophysiological location, you could say, their location in your psyche, but you can also note that the brain systems that are handling the memories aren't the same. So they're much more limbic, they're way lower and closer to the emotional centers when it's still raw trauma and by the time it's fully articulated, it's more represented in an articulated story, a causal story. And that's partly why writing about emotional events actually helps you overcome them. So, and it's possible that writing about how it is that you overcome emotional events in general is actually the best kind of therapy, right? Not how do you solve a particular problem. But how is it that you orient yourself in the world so that you solve the class of the fact that there are problems, right? That's, that's the ultimate story, and I think that's the hero myth, and I also think that that's the knowledge generating process that Piaget is talking about. You, that's because you ha you're constantly overcoming problems in the world, and the problems are that you don't know enough to get what you want from the world. And so you get that mismatch, mismatch. There's, you've got whole brain systems that are designed to do nothing but detect that mismatch, like crucial central brain structures. And we'll talk about that a lot when we get into the, into the physiology. So, all right, how does, on what does an individual base his judgments? How, what are his norms? How are they validated? How do you know if you're right about your norms? Um, what's the interest of such norms for the philosophy of science in general? That's a really tough one. It's like, well, you have norms and expectations as a human being, and because of that, they they have a determining influence on the manner in which you conduct science. So for example, here's one of the problems with a straight realist view. So we could be having a discussion and I could say, well, you know, that tile is to the right of that tile. And then I could say, well, this brick is smaller than that brick. And then I could say, you know, the roof is white, really quite white there and, and it's dark back there. And like after about 20 statements like that, you're just gonna wanna slap me. And the reason for that is that, well, those statements are perfectly valid representations of fact, but there's an infinite number of facts and most of them are irrelevant. And that's the thing, that's the thing. The facts have to be relevant. Like if you come to a lecture and all the person does is tell you irrelevant facts, what happens? You've been in lots of lectures like that. What happens? Well, you start fantasizing about something that might be more worthwhile, You know, or you go to sleep, because your brain is a lot smarter than you are. It figures, hell, if all we're going to get exposed to here is an infin infinite number of irrelevant facts, we might as well have a nap until something important happens. So it's true. It's exactly how it works. Now this is going to get big. Isn't that what happens next? No. So, okay, so, and then how does the fact that the child, children think differently um, affect our presumption of fact itself? Children live in the world. They think differently about the world, but yet they survive. And so, well, I already mentioned a partial solution to that. Adults intercede, you know, around the edges, around the borders. Children do this all the time, eh? So it's called referencing. Um, and they do it two ways. So, for example, if you're in a room with your child, maybe two, eh? And a mouse runs across, the child will orient to it, watch it, track it. That's pretty much unconscious. And the mother, let's say, will do that too. And then the child looks at the mouse and then looks at the mother. And the reason is, is because the child doesn't know what a mouse is. And so then it looks at the mother to read from the mother's face, which is a projection screen of emotions, how to classify the mouse in terms of import. And if the mother is like all calm about it and gives the kid a pat, it's like, you know, okay, whatever, you know, 
not danger. That's what the mouse is first. Danger, not danger. It's way after that that it's a mouse. You think, no, it's a mouse to begin with. It's like, these things are not so straightforward. They are not so straightforward. So anyways, if the mother climbs up on the table and has a screaming fit, then the child's already prepared because of this anomaly to be emotionally responsive. The child looks at the mother's face. It's got terror on it. The, mouse, the child thinks, small danger, big danger. It's like phobia, phobia, phobia. Now, all kids, that won't happen to because some are, are very emotionally robust. But if their child's very high in neuroticism, trait neuroticism, the probability that they'll develop a permanent, semi-permanent fear of the mouse is extraordinarily high. And that's what should happen, because the mother tells you what the mouse is, and, and the face doesn't say mouse. It says safety danger. And that's the first thing you want to know about something. Is it safe or is it dangerous? 